Join From Beer to the Bible every week as Irvin Lee and co-host Sarah Oliveira McDonald warn others of the consequences of drug and alcohol addiction by being the voice of faith-based recovery. Every week, Irvin and Sarah help people get access to the treatment and counseling they so desperately need. They explore the depths of addiction and give practical life examples of how to recover and develop a new rhythm of living. The show is gritty, authentic, and simply raw while being rooted in the love, faith, and hope of God. Welcome to From Beer to the Bible. Hi, and welcome to From Beer to the Bible. I'm your host, Sarah McDonald. We have a very special guest today, my good friend and spiritual mentor, Rhonda Kimball. Say hi, Rhonda. Hi, everybody. Before we get started, please like, share, and subscribe at FromBeerToTheBible.com. Today, we have a very special guest and title. We're going to be talking about Acts of Desperation, Lessons from Lot. Before we get started, we're going to come with a verse of the day, Deuteronomy 31, 8. The Lord himself goes before you and be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Today, we're going to talk about early childhood attachment gone wrong. Rhonda, what exactly does that mean? Well, as a licensed clinical counselor, what I am finding is the family of origin and the trauma that begins early in life. Now, I want to be really clear. Uh, when I say trauma, and we're talking about Bible application, we're also talking about sin, and I use them synonymously because I find that sin has been pathologized nowadays. Uh, you know, everything's a trauma, everything's a trauma, and it's true. Many things have, many sinful, awful things have been perpetrated against people, yeah. but, it, but sin is sin, no matter what, no matter what we call it, no matter how we dress it up, sin is sin, and it affects people. And when you're a primary caregiver, a mother, a father, a grandmother, a grandfather, an aunt or uncle, um, what you do with children affects them and it will affect them for the rest of their life. It also affects you and what has happened to you has affected you. Yeah. And so it goes and so it goes mm -hmm. and so it goes. Yeah. And so that's what I'm talking about. Early childhood um, attachment, how you attach, how you relate to your primary caregivers. Yeah. And often it's very what we call disorganized as a clinician. And why this is super important is because obviously this is a podcast um, on addiction and recovery and the Bible and sin and how it all comes together. And um, in this day and age, like Rhonda said, a lot of times we use the word trauma very loosely. Like I had a trauma when I was a child. This is why I drink so much. This is why I do X, Y, and Z. Um, and I think it's so awesome that Rhonda is an LPC, a clinical counselor and a Christian and that she blends the two together because it's easy for us to pass this off, off as trauma, but we forget as Christians that it is sin and it derives from, you know, the first sin. And, and I love that she puts that all together. So I just, I really am super excited for you to be here today so that you can really explain to us a little bit about both and so that our viewers can recognize um, where they might have a part to play in the story, whether you're a parent, whether you're the person that needs help or needs some kind of support, um, and how that all kind of fits together in, in today's society, in today's world. And so it's super important for us to remember where we came from as Christians, um, why we do the things that we do. And so, okay, tell us a little bit about, a little bit about Lot. Tell okay. us the story in the Bible that came you know, that brought you to this topic. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and paraphrase the story. So it comes from Genesis 19 and the scripture verses are 1 through 38. Okay. And so Lot, just before Lot enters this picture, Abraham is negotiating with God because he wants to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, the city of very, known for its sin. That's what, its reputation. Yep. Bad people doing bad things all the time. But Lot wanted to live there with his family. And God wanted to destroy the city. But Abraham said, if you can find one, <laughs> just one. So right off the bat, I want to tell you when you are a Christian, you have the power to talk to God. Yeah. So you're, you're never in the dark about things. You can use that power. And so Abraham was interceding for Lot. 
And he said, please, if there's one person, one righteous person, don't, don't destroy it. And God said, okay. So God sends a couple of angels to Lot to tell him, get out, get out of this city because God's going to destroy it. But Lot, being the important man in this sinful city <laughs> that he was, he says, let me come to my house. Let me be your host. And so the angels go. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I, I don't want to say angels because it gets too Bible heavy for people, but messengers from sure. God. And, and I'm sure in your life, you know, we've, we run into messengers from yep. God. They, they tell you something. You go, oof. Yeah. They had a lot of power behind it. <laughs> yeah. We talk about all the time on this show is being sponsors in, in recovery. They, they are a vessel that gives you whatever message you need at that time. At first, it's to keep you sober, but then it becomes, you know, a life director, if you will. But I always believe that it's God's voice working through them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And see, that's, that just validates that today, mm -hmm. God is alive and well in the way he works and the way he works in and through people. It's powerful. I, but you know what I find in, in the power of the 12 steps in recovery is, you know, you walk through the different steps to get to where you need to be. It's a, it's a life, it's a life path, if you will. But the 11th step talks about prayer and meditation. And so many times we pray, but we don't take time to meditate and listen to what God's telling you to do. And we don't take that direction very well. So. Exactly. Exactly. Well, here you go with Lot. So he's in communication. God's right there with him. They didn't enough prayer and meditation. Now he's telling them what to do. Mm -hmm. And this is where we can falter in recovery and just day-to-day -day life. When God tells you what to do and you don't do it, you start negotiating with them. Or you want to be the host of God or the protector of God. Because the truth is the messengers came to protect Lot and his family. Mm -hmm. So what they said is get out, get out of this city because it's going to be destroyed. Get your family together. Who is your family? My wife two daughters and two fiancés. Tell them you got to get out. So Lot goes to the fiancés and they said, oh no, we're staying here. We don't believe a thing that you're saying. So right off the bat, when God tells you to do things, there might be some people that need to be cut out of your life. You need to set them free. Yep. Right? Right off the bat. Love that. And then he gets home and, and there are all these men that he did business with and said, come knocking at the door. And they want to get their hands on these messengers. And they say, they said, give them to them so we can have sex with them. And Lot says, but I got two virgin daughters. So I'll hand them over to you. So right there, I want you to make a note. As a parent, have you offered your children up to evil people, evil society, evil, you know, whatever? Have you offered them up? Trying to protect God? Give trying us, to give protect us an example you? of how a parent can give up their children well allowing them to do certain things well, let, let me just give you the biggest one the iphone the iphone is not a good parent people yep right the downfall of our society isn't the iphone it's the parents who give them the phone mm -hmm. this is where the power is okay so lot makes his choice offers up his daughters but fortunately these messengers won't allow that so Lot goes out, tries to negotiate. The messengers pull him in because God is there to save him. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyway, the sun goes down. It's morning and the messengers tell him, get out now. Take your wife and your daughters and go. Don't look back. We're going to destroy the city. And the angels tell him, go up there. Go to the mountain. Do you ever hear that expression? Run for the hills. When there's trouble, <laughs> run for the hills. But no, Lot, he wants to negotiate. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go up to the hills. I don't want to. Can I go to that little, that little place, that little town, Zora? Can I go there? And you know God, he's a gentleman. He's not going to force you to do what you, just get out. Mm -hmm. Just obey. So they send him to the little town. The wife looks back on their way out. And she turns to a pillar of salt because she's clinging to the past. She's clinging to that life. How many times yeah. can you see yourself clinging to something, right? And you turn to a pillar of salt. Therefore, abandoning your children. No more mother in the picture because she's so caught up in the world. And, oh, no, I can't be a stay-at-home I got to go work. I got I to gotta be important. I got to be part of this because I feel good about myself there mm -hmm. without even giving a chance to what you can feel if you're here, where God's going, where God's sending you, right? No. So now they're without a mother. Dad offers them up to evil. Mother wants to cling to her past. What about the girls? 
what happens to these girls, right? And this is what they're observing. Mm -hmm. I learned a long time ago with children, it's not so much what you're telling them, it's what they're catching you doing. Yeah. That's really shaping who they are inwardly, okay? And, and that consideration, so much of parenting is done for the outward <laughs> expression or, or what people know, are going to view you. How you see. How, yep. Exactly. Exactly. But what about the inner life? Mm -hmm. What's going on inside? These girls must have been terrified. They must have been broken hearted because their fiancés pitched them. Anybody been dumped before? Yep. That's, that's a trauma. A, that's a big wound, yeah. right? Yeah. A trauma, a sin against them. They wanted to stay. Right in recovery, one of the first things we used to tell people: get out, get away from those people. Yep, get away. And even if they're your family member, there is a scripture in Matthew that says, "Some of your worst enemies will be found in your own home." Get out, get away. Even if it's your mother, or yep. father, or brother, said your fiance. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes that's God doing you a favor. And I love that verse because it gives you permission. But a lot of times we don't go to the Bible, right? We we think that we know best, or we think that you know protecting our parents or you know we need them there or you know even if they are doing us harm exactly so i love that that verse gives you permission even if it's just for a little bit that's to right get yourself in order to get yourself in order and then you get to decide through the holy spirit how, what relationship am i going to have with them and sometimes like abraham you said, leave your father's family and go where i'm showing you Sometimes there is no relationship to have. It's that dangerous. Yeah. Other times you need to set boundaries. And that is something in my practice that I teach many, many people. First thing, yep. boundaries. There's no boundaries. So they take off. They go to this little city. They're living there. And then guess what? Lot decides he wants to go up to the mountains and live in the cave. Hello. When God tells you to go, you may as well just go. We've seen this, you know, uh, uh, the the Israelites wandering the wilderness for 40 years when it was an 11 day journey. What? Yeah. They didn't do what God said. So when God tells you to do something, you probably want to do it immediately because you will end up doing it in the end. Yeah. But here is the caveat. So they go to the cave. Now they just come from a, a little town. And even though it's a little town, there's it's populated, right? But they get up to this cave and the older sister says to the younger sister, Oh my goodness, I'm so anxious about our future. I need to control our future. There's no men here to marry. Let's get dad drunk. Ooh, alcohol involvement. Okay, let's get dad drunk, have sex with him. I'll do it first, and then you do it. And they do it. Oh my God, I didn't even realize that. Oh yeah, so that's incest. So... We go back to the story for review and you have your dad offering you up. And this is just one point of their life and they're old enough to be married. So in the Jewish culture, I guess that's maybe the earliest, like 13 mm -hmm. or older. Mm -hmm. I don't know how old they were exactly, but they were engaged. So they have learned somewhere, alcohol involvement, let's have sex with dad. And the younger follows. Okay, because the older, usually when people are telling you things, older people. So we go back to early childhood attachment. When the older people are telling you things, your uncle, come here, sit on my lap, right? Your aunt, come here, touch me here and do this, right? And you do it because they're older. They're your authority. You think you're supposed to or they threaten you. I'm going to tell or if you tell, no one will believe you. Mm -hmm. And that's how these things happen. So you can see this. I mean, I'm talking way back in Old Testament days. Yeah. This stuff is happening. But people think, oh, the Bible is so irrelevant. It's so, is it, well, there's nothing new under the sun. Yeah. There's no it's new sin. Since the of time. That's right. But they didn't call it trauma. They had to address it as sin with God. With God, who knows everything. Yep. Right? He knew this was going to happen. But he still called Lot a righteous man, and he saved him, and he saved the girls, because he always has a plan. Yep. Even though we can't see it, and oftentimes when you're recovering or you're still battling that addiction, and you get into those low times, that guilt and that shame, you know, that just binds you. It's a, it's a part of it. Yep. 
it's part of the power of sin or trauma is it will bind you. And as a clinician, I like to help people move past that. Yeah. Okay. Nowadays, there's a lot of churches and stuff. They have these ministries where they're, they're inviting Jesus into their past. Well, God can't change the past. You see, he doesn't make the mother come back to life. He doesn't take back Lot offering his girls up. He just keeps moving forward with his plan. That's a good point. Okay. We don't, God can't change the past. Yeah. And I think that people in recovery, because my question when I was putting this together was, what would you say to women in recovery? I'd say, stop messing with your past. Yeah. When you stop messing with your past, it will stop messing with you. I always say that the past is where depression lies. Anxiety is where the future is. Just stay in the present moment. And in that present moment, the Holy Spirit is usually working. We're just not listening. Am I right? Or you're listening and, and you're, not yeah. obeying. Yeah. You're one foot, <laughs> one foot in, one foot out. Oh, yeah. And and you see, and, and this is, and this is why I like to tell this like a story because God was directing the whole time. Go to the hill, go to the mountain. Sure, I can't go to that little city. Yeah. Right? And he'll let us. He's not going to force us. That's this free will component that we get to come with, come to him. And that's what so many people don't understand free will. Can you explain free will a little bit? Well, we have the will to come to Christ. Yeah, they get confused because the scriptures tell us, you know, he chose us in, in Romans 8. And that sums up everything. Just study Romans 8. Ask the Lord for wisdom. And you will come to it one day, a full understanding of who he is. But um, it doesn't happen overnight. So free will is he's going to let you do whatever you want to do. So you're in recovery and then you you trip up. You fall off the wagon is the old expression. Yeah. But you know, the scripture talks about a good, a righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up again. So it's that something that drives you to get back up again, get sober again. And then one time, it just all of a sudden is gone. And I heard you say that in our friendship, that, you know, you, you the craving was no, gone. it was gone. Mm -hmm. I used to smoke cigarettes. I, I don't crave it. It's gone. And that would be the point of deliverance. Mm -hmm. So you get through the recovery to this point of deliverance. And then you're teaching, you're mentoring, you're supporting other people. I think a lot of times in, in Christianity and probably some of our listeners, we talk about free will, but they they hear this message like, if God loves me so much, why would he put me through X, Y, and Z? Or why would he do this to me? And that's not necessarily him doing anything to you. It's you not obeying or you not listening to the message. Well, it, and this is what's so important about language, right? You look at our school system. They're not teaching the kids to read, but God gave us his word. He wants us to know how to read yep. in case anybody's confused about that. But God is not doing things to us. Yep. He does things for us. And in my story here with Lot, he went to save them from destruction, from sure destruction. He was there. He sent messengers. Mm -hmm. How many warning? I mean, I love to talk to people. And you know, m most of us shouldn't be alive still. There's a point where you know, you know oh, God yeah. intervened. You should have been dead. Jesus took the will a lot of times. Right? Isn't that right? <laughs> you should have been dead. But you know what? He saved you and mm -hmm. he saved you and he will and he will until the day that you see him face to face as he really is and you're like him because he chose you and he's perfecting you and he's sanctifying you. And the key to this and the free will is to say, Lord, I'm just going to step back and let you manifest your perfections through me, in me, through me, so I can be useful and effective and productive for your kingdom yeah. in this fallen world, right? And it sounds so mystical and stuff but what's interesting is there are so many people that like these new teachings that make them feel good but when i say you have to step back that is a deal killer for so many mm -hmm. they don't want to step back they want to be important they want to be the one the, the big show sometimes you walk in these churches it's a big show I it's a money maker you're well you're a prime example of that because i think early on you had you had mentioned to me that you listened to God and you gave up your career to raise your children. Yes. And then you went back to school and you became a counselor. You've, you've done many things in your life, but share with us a little bit about how you listened to God um, in those early days and how you changed you know, the trajectory of your children's lives. Okay. Well, let me go back just a, a step further. I was very active in my church 
in Bel Air. So I spent my Friday nights at the LA Mission in the Ann Douglas Center. So before trauma was a thing, I'm talking about 35, 40 years ago, right? Before trauma was a thing, Marsha Tennyson and her dad had this model where we would take women off the street. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about hyped up on meth and crack, and it was when crack was a big deal, Especially right? Especially in LA. Big deal. <laughs> so we'd take them in, and they'd have three days, kind of like modeling Jesus, right? Three days in the grave. Mm -hmm. And we let them detox, and they were given scripture and really strict rules. about. They weren't allowed to leave. If you went in the program and you left, you couldn't come back. Of course, there was grace, but that was the very premise. And so, and then we just, it was a two-year program. And we loved them. I, I played bingo. I called bingo like every Friday night. And, you know, there's that scripture that, that, that says, oh, look at those disciples. They're all drunk. It's nine o'clock in the morning. They're not drunk. They're just filled with joy. Yeah. Right? I'm telling you, I know what that means. Because these women would just bring me joy. Just calling bingo. I'm telling you, there's no one more ordinary than me. But I would call it full of joy and they would receive it. And then these women would donate gifts. So there'd be prizes. And do you know those women would say, a watch? I just prayed for a watch. And God would answer their prayer just very simply. Yeah. But it was these were the women that never were clear-minded enough or able, safe enough to sit and, ah, I just got an answered prayer. Yeah. It was amazing. That's awesome. Um, 30 years of that. So that's what I did as a lay person, you know. And then I got to lead uh at Bible Study Fellowship, 15 mm -hmm. women, 30 weeks through books of the Bible and just sitting with them in their mess. And just so this is a calling for me. Right. I, never, I, I, I didn't get paid. I don't you know that it, it's a calling. Yeah. Right. So then I met my wonderful husband. And I was actually working in Beverly Hills at a, a personal management company. And then I felt called to, you know, I was 35 when I got married. There were times of discouragement yeah. up to that point. <laughs> you know? And I thought, gee, God has answered my prayer mm -hmm. for this wonderful husband. So I gave up my career and I stayed home. And then uh, it, and then we uh, wanted children. We lost two babies. But then our son and our daughter came. Again, you know, one minute you're losing something. And the next year you're holding your little baby. God is good. Yep. He's good. It's not a punishment. It's not what he's doing to me. It's what he's doing for me. And we have to be so careful about the words that we use. Yeah. You know, he didn't make you drink that gallon of liquor. Yep. Or, or you like these kids vaping today. Did you ever research popcorn lungs? Because that's what's going to happen. There's warnings all that, but nobody's listening. They're not listening. Yeah. Because they, they trade what's right for what they like without thinking of the consequences later. And that's what the free will is. So if you can keep in your mind, and then the more you mature as you walk with the Lord, it stays at the forefront of your mind. I'm living for eternity, mm -hmm. okay? Because real uh, rewards that can't be affected by uh, moth and wa rusty or anything like, they're in heaven. And, and so for even for me to sit and talk about the Lord here, you know, this is rewards in heaven for me. Yeah. Right? And it's so important. It's so important uh, because I want people to know, especially if you're down, especially if you're so down, isn't it? The suicide prevention month just packed. If you're so down to know one thing, and this, this was life changing for me. If I was the only person on earth, if you were the only person on earth, Christ would have come just for, for you. you. That's how special you are. Yeah. And so then it gets a little bit easier to give up your will for his will. Yeah. I'm going to stop you right there. We're going to come back with part two. If people want to reach you, Rhonda, where can they reach you at? Well, my uh, office phone number is 817-771-2728. I'm 100% virtual now. So I, I would look forward to speaking with people. Christian counselor and LPC. Um, and I love the way that she puts the two together. And so if Rhonda can help you, please reach out to her. We're going to come back with part two of Acts of Desperation, Lessons from Life. Thank you for tuning in to this week's From Beer to the Bible. Make sure to tune in next week when Irvin and Sarah gift you with even more addiction recovery information. 
Make sure to like, share, and subscribe. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And remember, we're always there for you.